everybody why don't you make your way in we're gonna get started right away here we'll get the worship team to to make their way up to the front it's a beautiful Sunday morning and it's great to have you here with us why don't you stand before we get it into worship David wrote and said I will bless the Lord at all times David wrote that in the wilderness as he was running for his life. In the natural, he didn't have any reason to bless the Lord. There was no imminent rescue coming for him. But he made a decision in that moment in the wilderness to say, I'm going to bless you, Lord, and your praise will be on my lips. I am still believe in God. What you spoke over me is going to come to pass. Even in the wilderness, even when somebody is out to kill me, God, I'm going to bless you. Because you are greater than my situation. You are greater than my circumstances. You are my God and you are worthy to be praised. Yeah. So Father, in this place, we thank you that your presence is with us right now. Father, we honor your presence. We say, God, have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, thank you. amen. Praise. Amen. Let's get our hands out. Let's begin to worship the Lord right from the very first song. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing, Lord. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. Yes, God. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, your mighty name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be glorious name blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me when the world's all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be, be your name. Bless you, Lord. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes. 
Lord, we have a future, Lord, all because of your name, the power in that name, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Because of that, we can't hold anything back in our worship. So today, let's open up. Let's open up our mouths, open up our hearts, open up our bodies, and move to the Lord today. Chosen, I am free. I am living for eternity. Free now, forever. You pick me up, turn me around. You set my feet on solid ground. Yours now, forever. Yours now forever 
Father, we thank you that you broke the chains. God, that you set us free, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. God, we pray that the freedom of the Lord would be in this place. And God, as we worship you and we seek you, God, that you would be blessed. At this time, we're just going to dismiss the younger children, ages 3 to 6, for Children's Church. Father, we pray that you would bless them as they go. God, that you would bless their teachers, that your presence would rest upon them upstairs God they would know you yet a young age and you'd reveal yourself to them in Jesus name Father continue to have your way in this service I'll be up later uh, in the service to dismiss the older kids after worship yourself in with the Lord as we sing these songs. Just open up your hearts, and Lord, we welcome your Holy Spirit just to move upon us, Lord. Move through us and among us to change our hearts, to draw our spirits, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. Give us eyes to see you all around us, Lord.
Give me eyes to see more of who you are May what I behold still my anxious heart Take what I've known and break it all apart For you, my God, are greater still sky contains no doubt restraints all you are the greatness of our God spend my life to know and I'm far from close to all you are the greatness of our God to see beyond this moment here to believe that there is nothing left to fear and that you alone are high above it all you my God a greater still and no sky and no sky sky contains and no sky contains no doubt restraints all you are the greatness of our God has been my life to know and I'm far from close to all you are the greatness of our God and there is nothing there is Yeah. 
nothing, no, there is nothing that could ever separate us. There is nothing that could ever separate us from your love. No life, no death. Of this I am convinced that you my God. Greater, Lord, much greater. No life or death, Lord. Nothing can separate us, Lord. For your love is so great. Higher than the highest mountain. Deeper than the deepest sea, Lord. Praise you for your mercy, Lord. Praise you for your mercy, Lord. Open our hearts and eyes, Lord. Open our eyes to you, Lord. So give me eyes to see more of who you are amen amen hallelujah thank you jesus praise god from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures the 
greatest Lord, the greatest God.
soul I give you control Consume me from the inside out Lord, let justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the inside out Everlasting Thank you. 
Hallelujah, Father. We believe that, that nothing in this world can satisfy. Lord, we're in this house, we're in this place this morning because we know that nothing in this world can satisfy the desire of our heart but you, Jesus. And Jesus, we believe that you are the cup that won't run dry. God, that you, you are the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God, that you want to pour out your spirit on your people, God, so that we can go to the world and, and reveal your presence to them, reveal your spirit to them, God, because they're seeking and they're lost and they're searching for something, God. And we declare, Lord, that something that they need right now is your presence. And God, we just make ourselves available to you. God, reveal, help us to understand your presence. Help us to understand the power of your presence, the power of being your people, God. We want to be disciples that go into the world, heal the sick, raise the dead, uh, cast out demons, God. And we need your presence, your manifest presence to go before us. So God, we pray that you would, in this place, help us to understand the power of your presence. God, that you would fill us up so that we can let it out over the world. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for all that you have done, but we know, God, there's so much more to come. God, we say, have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to dismiss the older children for Children's Church. They're going to go out the back doors here or uh, up the stairs most of them are already going so I'm just gonna let them go up that way <clears throat> I'm gonna just quickly uh, do some announcements here and then turn the turn it over to uh, Pastor Joe for today's message I would just encourage you to hold on to your bulletin and put it on put it on your fridge or just make bring it home with you I had like three or four phone calls frantic phone calls this morning does church start at 10 and I'm like <laughs> so Church doesn't start at 10, but if you get here at 10, you could, you could pray for us. So uh, I'm just, June 29th, the last Sunday in June is when we're making that switch to 10 o'clock. But if you take your bulletin with you and put it on your fridge, it'll be there and you won't, you won't uh, have to wake up with that feeling of panic that this is the day. Um, just a few, uh, I'm not going to highlight everything because everything's in your bulletin, but I do want to... I want to remind you that we're taking up a special offering for a young man, a young child who's struggling with um, cancer. We want to really bless that family. We want them to know that the church cares about them. And so if you would just pray about what you could do, if you could give towards that, just put on the envelope, offering envelope, special offering, and we're going to try to bless that family as best we can. Cheers is also, uh, we're going to be starting a healing room here at Cheers. And so... Um, that's something that has been birthed in the heart uh, of Darren. Darren, why don't you stand? He's at the back there. And so we're looking for people to get involved with that. And so Darren is the guy to talk to about that. The best time to meet with him or to kind of get information about that would be to come on Tuesday nights, and Darren will fill everybody in. But we are going to be, there is a whole training session that has to happen along with that. If you want to be, if you want to be a part of the healing rooms, you'll start that. Your, the first step is to connect with Darren, and then there will be a training that will go on. That's going to be on June 28th. I also want to point out that it, although it's in the bulletins, Beautiful Girls is now done for uh, the summer, and they might be picking that up later, but don't show up here Monday for Beautiful Girls because uh, there won't be anybody here. It cheers the church. We don't take up a traditional offering, but we believe in offerings and tithes. So at the back, we have our offering boxes. You can fill out an envelope, and you can get a tax, re tax receipt for that. Looks like Joe's really excited to get going here. So, so many I'm thoughts running right through my mind. And I was good through that whole process. I didn't say anything, you know, which I could have. Good morning, cheers. Good morning. Ah, it's a sunny day outside. I just love living in Penticton. There are some times where it's just a great place to be. Um, we grew up in Cornell. It's a great place to be from. <laughs> and uh, sunny days like today, it's just like, oh, thank you, Jesus. 
Uh, I'm here to preach this morning. Wasn't worship wonderful? Thank you. I quite enjoyed it. And I feel all uh, out of it a little bit, so I'm just trying to gather my thoughts here this morning. The title of my message this morning is, Is He Enough? Is He Enough? I don't plan on preaching for very long this morning. Just a few uh, things on my heart I want to share. And uh, we'll see where the Lord will take us after that. But is he enough? I often just, when you think of Jesus, you know, there's so many pictures that run through your mind. But when I, when I sit and I, I, I thought about this, is he enough? Just the simpleness of Jesus. Like when, when Jesus was just a baby lying in the manger and, and you know, he, he didn't come with a big procession. There was no entourage. You know, it wasn't, he didn't come with uh, big announcements or anything. He just simply came, this little baby in a manger. And uh, it was just so simple. And uh, I felt like God was saying to me, is, is that enough? Just that simpleness of just Jesus in the manger, that, that simpleness of when you strip everything else away from your life, is he enough? Is just having Jesus enough? At the beginning of the year, Dennis and I felt God speak to us that this was going to be a year of relentless pursuit. That was what we called this year for, for cheers, was uh, relentless pursuit. That we need to continue and with abandon go after the presence of God. That we cannot let up, that we cannot step back, that we cannot be content with what we have, that we cannot be content with what we have experienced. That God was calling us on to a deeper place, beyond what we have known, to, to a place of, of surrendering of our will, to a place of dependency on him. That God was calling us to go to a, to a, a, a deeper level uh, of experience with him, a, a deeper, uh, just a, a deeper place with him where we would not just be okay with what we've experienced so far, but there would be something in us that would say, no, I, I want something more. It's not okay with, with just coming and showing up on a Sunday morning. It's not okay with just doing my my." by religious traditions, but there's, there's something more and that, that there would be a, a, a hunger in us that would drive us in this relentless pursuit that would say, I'm going after God and I'm not content just to be in, in church every Sunday and, and just to have a nice, comfortable life. <laughs> oh, don't start yet because there's way more coming. <laughs> the, a place of dependency on him to see his kingdom, to see his presence established in, in, in our midst. See, I believe what has been going on is God has been wetting our appetites to build hunger in us, expectation, desire for more. I shared this verse the other day, and I just love it. It says, Proverbs 16, 26, the appetite of laborers works for them. Their hunger drives them on. The appetite of the laborer works for them. Their hunger drives them on. See, your appetite works for you. It causes you to want more. It causes you to not to be satisfied with where you're at. It, it, it leaves you unsatisfied. It'll push you to go be Beyond where you've been. Bless, uh, Matthew 5, 6 is blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. See, there's something about us in, in, in hunger for God that God loves. There's something about us as a people that we kind of have to stir ourselves up and say, no, I'm, I'm hungry for more. I'm not content because I, I really believe that choice is ours. Are you content with what you have? Are you content with the level of God in your life? Or is there something in you? Are, are you just going, no, you know what? I, I'm just, this is not okay. It's not okay just to have a nice house and, and a good job and, 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 and coast through to retirement. It's not okay just to, just to bring my kids to church so they have some Christian education. It, it, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something of God that, 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 will, that I just need, that, that I'm just not content and not okay with what there is in my life. I, it doesn't matter how long you've been in church. It doesn't matter uh, how long you've, you've grown up in church. It doesn't matter what you've known of, of, of God that, that, that still there's always that more and I believe God is saying if you're hungry for it if you're willing to go after it if, if you're willing to just say you know no to all of this and, and yes to this that God is going to release and he wants to release his glory in you you have to want more to get more 
We have to make room for the more of God in our lives. We have to desire more to see the more. Understand the deeper thing of, things of God have to be birthed out of our spirit. They have to be released in the natural. I like this in, in Elijah. This happened with Elijah in 1 King 18, verse 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink. For there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down on the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look towards the sea, he told the servant. And he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servants reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds and the wind rose. A heavy rain started to fall and Ahab rolled off. See, Elijah had to hear it in his spirit before he saw it in the natural. The Bible says he heard the, the sound of heavy rain in the midst of a drought, in the midst of in dryness. He heard it before he, ever, before he ever saw it happen. You see, something had to come alive in his spirit first. He had to hear with his spirit before he would see it released in the natural. And I believe what God is, is saying to us, you got to hear it in your spirit first. You, you got you to hear my voice speak to you first. It comes from your spirit first. Before you see it released in the natural. Elijah, before you see the rain fall, you got to hear it in your spirit first you got to grab a hold of it in your spirit first see are you hearing with your spirit this morning because God is looking for those that would hear with their spirit that would go beyond the natural Elijah he he heard the sound of heavy rain in the midst of a drought three years without rain in the, in the midst of this dry place yet he heard the sound of heavy rain and then what did Elijah do? He prophesied. This is going to happen. Look for it, he says. What? You don't see it? Look again. And again. Go back again. Seven times. He says, persist in this. Contend for this. Until they saw a small cloud. And in that moment, Elijah knew it was done. Yeah, it was small. It was just a small cloud. But when it hasn't rained in, in three years, a small cloud is very significant. When the, line, when the land's been dry, when there's a drought, even a small cloud is significant. And you have to be able to recognize the season. You have to be able to recognize the signs that are upon you. And I'm telling you, it may have just been a small cloud, but after three years of no clouds, it meant something. And Elijah knew this, and that's, and that's what he was looking for. And when he saw the cloud, he says, tell them to hitch up their chariot. I'm telling you, there's a storm coming. Yeah, it's just a small cloud, and you, it, it doesn't look very significant, but it means everything everything in the midst of a drought. And I believe God is saying to us as a church, you know, it's just a small thing that's happening. There's just a little bit of God's presence that's being developed and formed over this place and in our lives. But he's saying, do you recognize what's going on in a land of dryness, in a land of drought? It, there's a cloud. There's a cloud. There's a cloud gathering on the horizons. And God is saying to his people, if you will see that cloud, if you're willing to recognize what's going on, you're going to see a rain come. Don't, listen, don't miss out on what God is doing because it starts out small or doesn't look like much in the moment. It was just a small little cloud, but it changed everything. And God is saying to us, get ready, keep hungry, because he longs to release his spirit in your life. And his spirit is speaking, calling us to a deeper place. And this won't excite you if you want safe Jesus. You know, the one... Jesus petting the lamb with the blonde hair and blue eyes who, 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 who fits comfortably into your life. If that's what you want, this ain't going to excite you. And, and this probably isn't the church for you. You know, just send in your tithe. <laughs> I didn't think it was that funny. But if you want the Jesus that turned over the tables, 
If you want the Jesus that stood against the religious system, if you want the Jesus that took on a legion of demons, if you want the Jesus that caused dead men to live, if you want the Jesus that made blind eyes see and who said greater things that, than these you will do, that, then, then, that, then this idea of relentless pursuit is for you. If you want that Jesus that spoke to death and said, death, you are defeated. If you want that Jesus that stood against the, the, the religious Pharisees and said, no. If you want the Jesus that, 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 that stood against the oppressions of hell and said, set my people, they will be free. If you want the Jesus. Then relentless pursuit is for you. But see, it doesn't just happen by whimsical thinking. It doesn't just happen because I show up once in a while. It doesn't just happen. It's, there's a, it takes place in your heart. It's birthed out your spirit that says, no, I'm hungry for something more. I'm hungry because I see the brokenness of this world and, it's, and, and it, they aren't being satisfied and I just see brokenness and brokenness and brokenness and it's only Jesus that will fix it. That's just my notes that I wrote down during worship. <laughs> you know what's exciting? I believe we're seeing the beginning of the presence being released. The clouds are gathering. People are walking in here and they're co commenting on how they feel God's presence. And that's before the worship starts or the preaching begins. We have 50 people at prayer. That's the presence. We have Teen Challenge guys driving an hour and a half one way to pray with us. That's the presence. We have people getting healed. That's the presence. Many people tell me how when they first come to cheers, they can't stop crying. That's the presence. I talked to a lady on Tuesday night. She said it was like she put her, when she got prayed for, it was like she put her finger in a light socket. That's the presence. It's a God thing. And I believe God's just responding to, to, to the hunger of people's hearts. It's, it's not, it has nothing to do with us. It's, it's not because we got this or that. It's not because we're good preachers or good worship teams or, or we have great structures or systems. It's simply because there's a people who have come together that have said, I want something more. There's a people that have gathered together and said, you know, let's go after this. Let's push into this. Let's allow this to, to, to permeate our lives. Let's make our lives about this, not about some fancy vision statement, not about just some 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 fancy looking church with all these these great things and I'm not against that but there's got to be something more and I believe that we're on the verge because God is hearing the cry of our hearts and if we continue to stay hungry if we continue to pursue it if we continue to say this it's only this and it's only this and it's only his presence then I believe God's going to respond So this morning, I want to encourage you. This is no time to back down. This is no time to let up. See, the funny thing about the presence of God is that sometimes it leads you into some very hard places. Sometimes the presence of God leads you into dark places. I think of Paul and Silas in prison, worshiping God in the midst of, uh, of being in a hard place led by the presence, and yet they're, they're, they're finding the presence even in that hard place. And I want to encourage you this morning that even in the hard place you might be in, that the presence is there. You can find the presence even in the hard place. And I believe that it's, it's in the hard place that God really begins to pour out his presence to a greater level. That it's not just that, okay, we've come and we've had hunger and we're willing to press in, but there's also a, a willingness even in the hard place, in the times of attack, in the times of adversity, in the times where it's just hard, where we continue to have this heart that say, but okay, but I'm still going to praise him. I'm still going to press him. I'm still going to know him. I'm still going to go after him. Amen. So keep pressing in. Stay hungry. Be open because this is just the beginning. Amen. But I also feel, and this is really my message this morning, like God wants to challenge our hearts in the area of motivation when it comes to God's presence. See, the presence brings a lot of excitement and great things with it. 
When the presence of God begins to rise in a place, you see increase in anointing, you see increase in gifts, you see increase in miracles, you see increase in salvation, you see increase in, in blessing. And so this is part of what will, what will happen the more that we get into this, the more God's presence begins to settle over our lives. We're going to see these increases in our lives. And that's a great thing. That's exciting. We know this because when Jesus showed up, his presence released the supernatural. Jesus didn't just preach good messages and he didn't just give five steps to success. He didn't just do good deeds. His life, his ministry was marked by the supernatural. It was a common theme to his life. When Jesus showed up, it, it, it began to, the presence began to release. As, as he showed up, wherever he went, there was this release of the supernatural as well. And, and when he went to the Father, his disciples, like us, had the presence of the Holy Spirit. And what followed in their lives was a release of the supernatural, was a release of the anointing, was a release of all the things that come with the presence. In Acts 2, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. See, when the presence rises... The gifts and the anointing and, and, and all the things with it also begin to rise. The supernatural was common in the early church as they lived their lives in, in openness to God's presence. These simple men who just embraced what God wanted to do in their lives and through their lives, they saw and experienced the power of God. And the presence of God is on, in the rise in this place, and we're going to see more and more. Because God's plan has always been that the supernatural be common in the believer's life. That's, that's how your life is to operate as a Christian. As a Christian, you're to have the supernatural in your life. That is throughout, throughout the New Testament, throughout, throughout the history of the Bible, the supernatural always came with the believer's life. That is the common theme and it needs to be common in our lives. But the danger and what I want to speak to is that we can start to reduce the presence of God. It's easy to get caught up in the excitement. It's easy to become about what is happening to focus and be motivated by the outpouring. And what can happen is we start to look for an experience instead of the presence. It becomes about what the presence has led us to, not about the presence itself. See, our hearts always have to be about the presence. It always has to be about him and him alone. He always has to be enough. No matter my circumstance, no matter my situation, good or bad, is he enough? Simply him. He has to be my longing. He has to be my desire. He is my one. Yes, things, the great things come with the, with the presence, but he is the great one. And the danger is that we start to seek him for what he gives us. Well, we can get out of that relationship. Not seeking him because we're in love. In Acts 8, we have the story of Simon the sorcerer. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him the, their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that were there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given on the laying of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before, the, before God. Repent of the wickedness and pray the, the Lord in the hope that he might forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. There's many truths in this story, but what I want to focus on is just how 
Simon's heart was motivated by the wrong thing. Simon is a man, and he's had a real experience with God. He's come to this place of salvation. And now he sees the power of God. And the Bible says he's following Philip around, astonished at the signs and wonders. He's impressed. He likes what he sees. I mean, it's amazing. And he wants, he wants to be in on it. He wants more of the power. He wants the gift. So he offers money. He offers what he has. And Peter comes down on him. He gets upset with Simon. And he tells Simon that his issue is that his heart is not right before God. It was a heart issue for Simon. It was about what was motivating his heart. His motive was the gift, not the presence. He wasn't seeking God, but he wanted the power. It was all about what he could get. It was all about, the, about being a person of power. It was, it was about being recognized. He saw the Holy Spirit as a means to an end, something to be used. And it wasn't even that, that his, his, his intentions were, were bad. The Bible said he, he wanted the power. He wanted to be able to lay hands on people that they might receive the Holy Spirit. He wants to, really, he, he wants to be part of the ministry. He wants to be in ministry. But Peter's upset. Why? Because Simon has reduced the presence of God to what he can get. He wants to use the presence for the gifts that he can receive. He, 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 he's, he's like, yeah, this is great. And, and he, but he, he, it, wasn't, it wasn't that he wanted the relationship with God. Rather, he wanted what the power that came with the relationship. Let me illustrate this for you. My little Linnea, she is a, uh, she is a bit of a, a, a turkey. Um, she is, I, I believe, a bit of a, what we call a strong-willed child. She hides it behind this really cute package. So every, you all, you all, you know, you get sucked into that and she thinks she's really cute. But she's, there's another side to her. She only wants to do what she wants to do when she wants to do it. And you have to fit in her world. She likes to be the boss. I'm assuming she gets that from her mother. <laughs> so I come home from work the other day, and I see her. You know, I've been gone all day. You know, she should want to run to my arms and greet Daddy. <laughs> and so I'm like, Linnea, give Daddy a hug. And she says her favorite word as she runs away from me. No. <laughs> so I say, Linnea, give Daddy a kiss. Again, No. I say, Linnea, give, give me a high five. At least give me a high five. <laughs> no. So now I'm feeling re really rejected. And so I do what we all do in those times. I turn to food for comfort. <laughs> but in order to keep my boyish figure, I grab a piece of fruit. So now I'm walking around the house, and I got this piece of fruit. And uh, all of a sudden, Linnea wants to be with Daddy. She comes running up to me and she, and she wants me to pick her up and, she's, and, she, and she gets into my arms and she opens her mouth like a little bird and she's like, she's following my piece of fruit around. It's all, oh, you know. <laughs> she's not shy now. She, you know, she wants my food and she's giving me hugs and she's giving me kisses and, and daddy's all of a sudden the greatest thing. See, her thinking was, I'll take the presents because of what comes with it. All of a sudden she's good with dad because she's going to get something out of the deal. See, sometimes we fall into this trap of worshiping what comes with the presence instead of the presence. Yeah, we want more God because then I'll be more prophetic. We, I want more of God, then I'll be a better preacher. I want more God, and, and then I'll be a better worship leader. If I get closer to God, then, then he's going to bless me financially. If I get closer to God, then, then I'll get that promotion. If I get closer to God, then I'll have better health. It becomes about what I'm going to get or what I'm going to receive instead of about God. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, God, well, you got something for me? Oh, God, you know, I'm going to pray really hard today. Oh, I'm going to go to prayer on Tuesday night because God's going to, you know, good things are happening, and I, I want to receive some of that. It's not because the longing of my heart is just so, I just need God. It's like, but, you know, maybe if I get close enough to God, it's almost this manipulation that we try to play into. If I get close enough, then everything will work out. You know, if, if, I, if I open up enough, then everything will work out. If I, if I do the right things, if I read my Bible enough, if I pray enough, if I worship hard enough.
And it's, it's not that these are bad things. Yes, I, you know, I, great. I want you, we should all profit, prophesy. We should all be great preachers and, and great worship leaders. And I hope you're all blessed financially. But when we, but when we try to end, uh, manipulate God with our good behavior, impress him with our dedication, it becomes a work-driven behavior. Look at me, look at me, God. I'll be a good Christian, then God will bless me. I'll draw near to God, and then things will go well. We reduce our relationship with God to principles over presence. I'll do all the right things. And so the motivation of my heart isn't that I want my father. The motivation of my heart is that I want what my father will give me. You know, and I think it's fine when you're like two. You know? But I have higher expectations of my nine-year-old than my two-year-old. Like, I understand, like, the, that's, Linnea is driven out of, out of this two-year-old thinking and two-year-old understanding and, and her two-year-old needs. Church, we aren't two-year-olds anymore. The motivation of my heart just can't be for what he gives me. The motivation of my heart can't just be for what I get. We really got to get beyond that. It's got to be, but it's my father. But it's Jesus. When everything else is stripped away, and I believe that's why oftentimes when someone gets saved, they start out and everything goes good at first. You know, and it's, it's like, wow, this Christian thing, man, this is a good deal. But you give us some time. And then God seems to kind of lead you into this place. And it's like utter darkness and destruction of your life. <laughs> and you're like, Really? I didn't sign up for this. Like the preacher, he was telling me about how God's going to bless me and all the good things that are going to come over my life. And he didn't tell me about this place. But see, if, 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 I, if, if I allow this place, in this place, to let everything be stripped away, and I still stand there and go, okay, but, but the Father's there. But the Father's there. And somehow, in that moment, if God becomes enough, if it's simply, because it's like, okay, yeah, I lost this, and I lost that, and there's this hurt, and there's this hurt, but I got the Father, and I don't understand why this is going on, and I don't understand why this ain't working out for me, but, but I got the Father, and, and you, 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 in this place is where you grow up. In this place, you learn how to trust Him. In this place, you, 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 you become where everything else is gone. It's like, okay, but I got the Father. And, and if you can find Him there, if you, you're, if you can stay in that place and be okay because you got the Father, then let me tell you, you're going to go places. Then all those other things he's going to take care of. But it, it, this is the place where I grow up. This is the place where I go from a two-year-old thinking to, to an adult thinking. Is he enough? Our focus cannot become what we get or what we're after. It's got to be on that love relationship with the king. Listen, God doesn't want to be second place in your life to anyone or anything. That includes your ministry. That includes your gifting. That includes your anointing. That includes his blessing. So you have to ask yourself, what is your motivation? How do you see God in your life? Is he your lover or your sugar daddy? (laughs) See, that one was funny. I appreciate that. (laughs) You know, what's a sugar daddy? Like people who have sugar daddies, they're just using their, let's not, actually, let's not go there. <laughs> Is it just him he, you want or what he does for you? See, God desires a love relationship with you. He wants to be your everything. He wants to be wanted out of love. He wants your obedience not because you're trying to gain from him, but because you don't want anything to hinder that relationship. Is he enough? Is he enough? The second way we we reduce the presence of God is we make the presence of God become about the success of our dreams. In the last five years, I've had so many friends walk away from God. Many of them have been ministers. These were people I admired. I learned from them. I was mentored by them. And it's really got me questioning and examining and looking at their lives, and, and for the majority of them, I saw this common trend. 
See, one of the things that happens is, is, is the presence of God, when it, it brings vision and dreams to our lives. That's part of, of, of what happens when the presence of God uh, comes into your life. There's a release of presence and uh, vision and dreams. And they're great. They're life-giving. They give you purpose. They capture your heart. When God speaks to you and, 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 and gives you a dream or a vision, I mean, it's just like, wow. It, you know, it can be so all-consuming. And that's part of the trouble is sometimes it can be so all-consuming. And, and what happens often is the dream becomes our motivation. I had this one friend who I worked closely with for a lot of years, and he was an amazing motivator, a visionary, someone of immense talent. You know, one of those guys. <laughs> he would walk into a room, and with five minutes, literally, he would just walk into a room, and right away, like, boom, it was like, ah, everyone saw him. Everyone wanted to be his best friend. He was like the center of the room. He made you feel like a wallflower. I mean, he had presence. People were attracted to him. And, and, and he knew the presence of God. I saw him speak at some camps, and the, and the power of God was just so evident in his life. Some of my most memorable ministry times were ministering with him. Like there was no doubt in my mind God was with him. And he had such dreams. But what started to happen was he became vision driven. The dream started to be everything. And over time, when he didn't see that dream come about and it wasn't happening like he thought he should, he started to get disillusioned. It's like, God, I, I got this dream. Why is it not happening? God, you gave me this dream, you gave me this vision, and I'm going after it, but it's not being fulfilled like I think it should be. And all of a sudden, it was no longer enough to have God's presence, but it became all about the success of the dream. It came all about the fulfillment of the dream. The very God thing that God re, uh, God's presence released in his life became his stumbling block. See, we have to learn is that we don't chase dreams, we chase the dream giver. It's, it's not about the dream, it's about the one who gives the dream. Understand, God is the author of the story, and how your part plays out is up to, up to him. Your dream is, is really just part of the bigger dream. See, their overall picture is always bigger than us. Your dream is part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Let me, let me show you this. In, in Hebrews 11, we have the story of Abraham. Listen to what happened in, to Abraham. It says in, in verse 8, By faith Abraham was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance. Obeyed and went, even though he did, he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with, fo the city with foundations, who architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was unable to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and as, he, as good as he dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they, when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting they were foreigners or strangers on earth. Think about Abraham, okay? Think about this for a second now. Now, he had this God-given dream. God spoke to him and, and gave him a dream. That his descendants would be as numerous as the stars and as countless as the sand. Yet when Abraham died, he died with one descendant to the promise. There was one. Isaac was the only direct descendant to that promise. And he didn't know that, it, that his story was going to get passed on. He didn't know that for hundreds of years that his, his descendants would share the story from one generation to the next generation until Moses one day would write it down. See, we stand back in time and we can trace the whole dream. But for Abraham, he was just one part of it. When Abraham laid on his deathbed, he didn't know the rest of the dream and how it was going to be fulfilled. He only knew that there was Isaac. And the dream was for countless, the, as many as the sands, as countless as the stars. The dream was so big, yet he lay on his deathbed only seeing Isaac. See, I believe that Abraham was motivated by the presence, not the success. 
That's why he was willing to sacrifice Isaac on the altar because he knew that having God, being obedient to God was more important than having a dream fulfilled. See, Abraham wasn't chasing a dream, he was chasing God. And, but when we reduce the presence of God to just a dream or a, a vision, then that becomes our everything. Like you don't know the rest of the story. You can't see the fullness of the story around you. Whatever God has placed in your heart, you know, cherish it, bless it, but leave the, the result of it up to God. Leave the fulfillment of it up to God. There have been so many times where God has spoken to my life. I've shared some of them. Uh, I, one guy prophesied over me one time, you're going to work with men, you're going to work with men. When I was young, first in ministry, in my mind, I was like, man, I'm going to be preaching to men's, you know, men's groups. I'll be like on Promise Keepers, 50,000 men, and I'll be preaching. <laughs> Three years ago, I started working at a men's shelter. And I'm like, and then one day it just struck me, oh, I'm working with men. <laughs> in my mind, it looked a lot different. <laughs> the fulfillment of the dream is not up to you. And if you become so dream-driven, so vision-driven, and that becomes the everything, then you're going to miss out on what God wants to do in you and through you. And you, it, it, I'll tell the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. That's hope deferred because your hope is in something that's not correct. Your hope is in the dream, not the dream giver. If your hope remains in God, if your hope remains in, in just his presence, if, if, and, and I, you know, I often do this I, I, when I'm in the mornings, I go to my office and I just, I have a time alone with God and it's just me and God. And I, I, I often just, even say, I say, God, you know, everything else, right now, everything else is gone, God. You know, I'm in this office. No one cares about me. No one knows me. I, I'm, I'm a nobody in this moment. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a, a leader. I'm, I'm nothing. I'm just your son in this moment. And God, in this moment, you are enough. God, in this moment, Lord, I just want you in this moment. And it, I, I, when, when, because the thing is, you have to be able to strip everything else away and, and have those moments where it's like, okay, God, it's just enough because I have you. It's just enough because you're with me. It's just enough because you're touching my heart. It's just enough because I'm encountering you. It's just enough because I'm a son calling out to my father and I'm visiting with my father. It's just enough because you're just enough. And you have to find that place in your life where everything else gets stripped away. And, and, and it's not about you prophesying. It's not about you speaking out. It's not about you, you leading a ministry. It's not about, you know, about what God's doing in your life. It's not about the, the blessings. It's, it's simply because you're with the Father. So many friends I've seen walk this path and become so vision driven and so dream driven, so success orientated and then when it doesn't happen then what? You placed your hope you placed your, 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 your whole believing and your whole dreaming into this instead of him dreams are great I love dreams. I got big dreams. I got all kinds of dreams. Sometimes I wish I could just shut up because there's just, my wife gets tired of hearing because, oh, I got this dream. We should, you know, everything's a big dream to me. I can't just stop at like, you know, let's just have a nice car and a nice house. No, let's have like a truck and a motorcycle and a, and a man. You know, like it's always got to be bigger and better. It's just like, but strip all that away. What about God? Where is God? Is, is, is he enough? Is he enough? See, I believe we all have to come to a place where we're willing to lay it down. I believe God always takes us to that, that place where it's like, you know, I thought this, but it, that's not happening. I just have to be able to lay it down. I have to lay down that dream. I have, to, I have to be able to lay down my ministry. Seven years ago, eight years ago, we um, left trail my favorite sun season. I've shared that before where it's just like everyone loved me. I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And, and then God brought us to Sycamus, BC and I was, end up like working construction for 12 bucks an hour shoveling gravel all day. Having some 19-year-old kid be my boss tell me to shovel faster. I just wanted to shove the shovel somewhere. <laughs> and uh, I mean this church with like 10 old people, literally like 10 
no, I mean, I love old people, Grandma. I love old people. <laughs> but I'm literally this church with like 10 old people. I was just like, God, really? Like I had all these dreams. I had all these, these things I thought was going to happen with my life. And, and I had all this, but here I am. And it's just like, there's nothing. We're living in this hotel room. And, and if we just have nothing. And, and I would go into this little church because it was right next to our, our, our hotel and, and the pastor gave me a key and I'd go in there night after night and I would just cry out to God. And I real, really felt like God was saying, okay, Joe, if this is it, are you okay? If this is it, the ministry's all gone now, your friends are gone, if this and what you have right now, if this is it, are you Okay. And I couldn't just, you know, maybe some of you are more spiritual than me and you could say, oh, yes, God, yes, Lord, whatever. But I'm not that spiritual. And so I had to, like, wrestle that out. And I had to say, okay, God, if you give me your presence, if I have you, then this will be okay. I'll probably whine about it a lot and I'll probably get upset time and time again. But if I got you, God, if I got you, and I had to come to that place of just laying it down. And I believe that's what God is saying to us this morning. Are you willing to lay it down? Are you willing to lay down your talent? Are you willing to lay down your dreams? Are you willing to lay down the, the spiritual gifts? Are you willing just to lay it all down? Is he enough? Simply, is he enough? Why don't you stand with me this morning? Brian, if I can just get you on the keyboard. Just take a moment with God this morning. Start looking at your life. Maybe it's a relationship. Are you willing to lay it down? Maybe it's a job. Is he enough? If you got him and him alone, is he enough? Look at the motivation of your heart this morning. If you never pray another prayer, if you never preach another sermon, if you never... Whatever it is your thing is, if you never do that again, is he enough? In our culture today where we're driven by success and we're driven by being someone or being something. It's just having him, is, is that enough? Father, this morning we come before you, God. Lord, we confess at times, Lord, I confess at times that it becomes about the dream. It becomes about what you do for me and what you give me. Lord, I pray that you would just give us that simple child heart that just wants to be with the Father. Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, those, those things that we think are so important. God, that we try to feed ourselves on, that we try to satisfy our souls with God. Lord, we just confess at times other things become more important. And Lord, in this moment, God, we just surrender. We say, forgive us, Father.
just going to ask the rest of the worship team, why don't you come, why don't we play this song and just as a declaration of over our life, declaration of truth in our hearts that his presence is enough.
we serve a great God. He loves you, has a great plan for you. Good things are coming. Be blessed.